it just it felt kind of right. It felt right like no other vehicle I had driven before. When you pressed on the accelerator, you accelerated. You kept accelerating. There was no shifting. There was no engine noise. When you took your foot off the uh, accelerator, you, you started to coast. When you put your foot on the brake, you started to brake, but that energy was now going back into the battery as opposed to just turning into heat in the heat pads. And it just it it just kind of made sense in a way that no other car had. Hey, thanks for listening to the podcast. I'm your host, Scott Miller. Let's create a cooler world. Last year, I really started to notice how many people in my neighborhood drive electric vehicles. And it wasn't because I saw a lot of them. It was the sound. Have you noticed that electric vehicles sound different? I'll be outside in my yard or inside with the windows open, and I'll hear a car go by, and I can tell it's an electric vehicle by the distinctive electric sort of high-pitched whooshy hum it makes. You know the sound I'm talking about? Hybrid and electric vehicles have been around for a while, but it seems like just in the last year or so, there are so many more of them around, at least here in my neck of the woods. The shift to electric vehicles is an important step in humanity's effort to stop climate change, but it does raise an important environmental concern. What are we going to do with all of these used electric vehicle batteries when they start to wear out? A company called Smartville has an answer to that question. Our guest today, Bill Von Novak, is the director of engineering at Smartville. Bill earned his degree in electrical engineering at MIT, and he has a few decades worth of experience working with power systems for electric vehicles and UAVs, aka drones. Bill's name appears on 96 patents, and his goal is to get to 100. He has also helped artists at Burning Man replace fossil fuel powered generators with solar power and battery storage. Today, Bill is going to tell us about the work that Smartville is doing to transform used EV batteries into sustainable energy storage systems. These storage systems can be used off grid, but they can also provide backup power for buildings. And they can even be used by power companies to prevent blackouts and brownouts during times of high energy demand. Bill is going to tell us about the ways that Smartville's power systems are already being used and some of the things that he's hoping to see in the future. So, Bill, thank you for joining us today. It's great to have you here. No worries. We're going to talk a little bit about your work with Smartville, and we'll get to that in a second. But if you don't mind, I'd love for you to tell everybody a little bit about your background and how you got involved in this work that you're doing today. Sure. Um, a long, long time ago, I was at MIT, and I did my uh, thesis in the MIT Power Systems Lab. So I got kind of into power at an early age. And back then, solar and storage, there there wasn't much going on. Um, the solar panels you could get were on the order of $10 a watt, which means they're kind of not affordable for anything other than satellites and kind of demonstration projects. But it, it fascinated me, like the idea of being able to generate power from the sun. So I, I kind of kept it in the background. Stayed in New York for a while, worked at a power supply company, moved out to California and got a job at Qualcomm, where I was mostly working on cell phones, but kind of kept that power thing going in the background. Um, towards the end of my time there, I was working on a project called uh, E0, which was a Qualcomm project to try to reduce energy use in homes by coordinating everything through uh, wireless connectivity. And that was a lot of fun. Then Qualcomm started to get away from research, so I left there. I ended up at this place called Smartville, where I'm at now, where we're doing a lot of this kind of work that I've been doing in the background for a long time. So it's it's fun to kind of turn something that was once a once a hobby, just an interest, into a into a full time job. And you have a, a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from MIT and a degree in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. 
you also, I noticed you have, your your name is on a few different patents. Uh, you're cited as the inventor on a patent for methods that allow multi, a multi-rotor UAV to safely land with no energy remaining in, in the battery. Am I am I understanding that correctly? That would be like flying a drone, what we, most people would know as a drone, and when the battery dies, the thing can still land safely. Is that accurate? Yes. Um, I'm actually up to 96 patents. My goal is to get to 100 um, before I retire. And the patent that you're talking about is, it came about because Qualcomm did get a little bit into uh, UAVs, and we were looking at ways to kind of safely land drones that either had a were out of energy or just had a battery system problem, because back then batteries were not super reliable. They're, they're getting much better. I saw you also have other patents that involve wireless charging and data transfer for electric devices. You also mentioned in our earlier conversation that you've done some work for artists at Burning Man. Would you share a little bit about that? Um, sure. Um, as most people are aware, Burning Man is kind of an inhospitable environment. Um, it's in the middle of the desert. There are sandstorms. There are This year there was a, a flood. There was a lot of rain. All of that means it's difficult to get power to art projects that need it. And a lot of art projects in, on, out on the playa have a lot of people going to them at night. That seems to be when everybody comes out to look at art. That means you have to light them, you have to provide power for them. The traditional way to do that is with a generator. But generators are loud, um, they're physically big, they kind of distract from the aura that they want to have around a lot of this art. And it means you have to carry fuel out to the playa to fuel them we have to bring it from a long distance away. Got to go, go out there every day to add the fuel back to the generator. And a lot of artists just don't want to deal with that. So uh, there's actually a cooperative that provides solar power and battery storage for artists that want it. And I'm not too involved with that, but there have been a couple of people who have come up to me and said, hey, I really want to do this project. I want to have, have a projector that shows this video stream at night. I want to have a, you know, these LED lights that flash in this pattern, but I want to do it at night and I need some power for that. So I've put together a couple of systems that I can effectively give people and they can roll out there and set it up. It's interesting, maybe for people who aren't familiar with um, electricity, like you were talking earlier about solar panels where the cost would be like $10 a watt. And we're thinking like maybe 60 watts is what it would take to power a light bulb, and then kilowatts is more along the range of what we might be looking for for actual more practical energy solutions. Is that am I kind of on the right track with that? Yeah. So let me give you another unit. There, um, we've got watts and kilowatts, which you described pretty well. Um, we also have kilowatt hours, and so watts and kilowatts are a measure of power. Kilowatt hours are a measure of energy, and that's the amount that you get out of a battery. So when we're talking about kilowatts, it's basically how many light bulbs we can turn on at the same time. When we talk about kilowatt hours, it's how long we can keep the light bulbs on. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I imagine some people have heard maybe these terms, and that's that's a, a, a good, clear explanation. And you were talking about your first time driving an electric vehicle. I think you said that was back in 1993. Could you tell that story? Um, sure. We I was working for a small company, Custom Power Systems, and we were building accessories for electric vehicles. And at the time, the only people building electric vehicles were either hobbyists or companies like Ford and GM, and they were just starting to get their feet wet and trying different, trying different things. They knew that the requirements were coming for electric vehicles, so they were starting to do the research. So we were building a charger for a Ford vehicle. And at one point we were talking to the engineer and he said, you, you guys should come out and see this vehicle. So we um, went out there, it was somewhere on the East Coast, I forget where. And we got a chance to drive it around. This was one of the very first EVs that Ford had built. It was bulky. It was temperamental. There was a circuit breaker that kept tripping, and then you just kind of coast to a stop. Um, but while it was working, it just it felt kind of right. It felt right like no other vehicle I had driven before. When you pressed on the accelerator, you accelerated. You kept accelerating. There was no shifting. There was no engine noise. When you took your foot off the uh, accelerator, you, you start at the coast. When you put your foot on the brake, you start at the brake, but that energy was now going back into the battery as opposed to just turning it to heat in the heat pads. And it just, it 
it just kind of made sense in a way that no other car had. You know, at that point, I had a, I had an ancient manual shift four cylinder car, and the contrast between the two of them was was pretty remarkable. So I was, I was excited for where Ford was going to take it from there. Yeah, interesting. It's reminding me of my first time. I think I told you this story. Some somebody let me drive a Prius one time, and I thought it was really cool. It was like driving a, you know, a, a go kart sort of, but a real car. So I'd love to hear about your your work now with Smartville. Um, could you tell us what Smartville actually is and and what you do there? Sure. Um, I'm the director of engineering right now, which is a, a fancy way of saying I'm currently the only electrical engineer. We had some people here, uh, electrical engineers. One hurt herself, the other one quit. We're getting another one. So right now it's just me. Um, and what Smartville is trying to do is we're trying to intercept that stream of used battery that's, batteries that's going to be coming out of EVs. There's a lot of EVs out there right now. I think there's 2 million in the U.S. now. And as they get older, the batteries start to wear out. And at some point, people are going to junk the cars because they're old or because they want a new one. And at that point, those batteries become available. The batteries typically still have between 50 and 90% of their storage capacity left. So a Tesla that has a 60 kilowatt hour battery pack, you know, might have between 30 and 50 kilowatt hours of storage capacity left. And that's a lot of storage that can run a house for a day, for example. So we know that eventually the batteries are going to get so old that they have to be, be recycled. But in between the time that we take them out of the car and we recycle them, we thought, hey, this is an opportunity to use them for something else, to, to give them a second life. So we started this company. And the idea behind this company is that we intercept those batteries, we put them into battery storage systems, and we use those battery storage systems to store power from renewables that are intermittent, like solar and wind, that don't always produce. And so when the solar and wind is producing, we store the energy. When it's dark, when the wind's not blowing, then we use the energy that's stored in the batteries to go back out to the grid to power loads. So that's the that's the fundamentals of the company. When was Smartville started? Um, we started about four years ago. I joined them about two years ago. Um, previously to that, I had been working with a another company called Watt Whale, which was doing this on a much smaller scale. And the CEO of Watt Whale introduced me to these guys, and they had a need, so I, I moved over, and I've been here for two years now. And the uh, the co-founders of Smartville are Anthony Tong and Mike Ferry. It sounds like they met at the University of California um, and started this idea there. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, Anthony was a professor at UCSD. Mike ran the one of the power systems labs over there, and... They got together, started talking about it, and thought this would be a, you know, be worthwhile effort to pursue, and that's how Smartville got started. And could you talk a little bit about these these actual storage solutions that Smartville is creating? These like the uh, Smartville 360. What is this actually? So for someone who's never seen this, maybe we'll include like we'll definitely include a link or maybe a picture in the uh, the show notes. But what does this actually look like for somebody who has no idea what this is, and, and what does it do? So the Smartville 360 is a cabinet that, can, that contains between eight and 24 batteries. And the one that contains eight is about, it's a cabinet that's maybe eight feet by eight feet by nine feet, will fit on the back of a truck. And it contains um, eight, eight EV batteries. So it's it contains about 360 kilowatt hours of energy. That's where we get that number from. Um, it also contains a few inverters so that you can hook it up to a 480 volt AC system. And 480 volts is what most large large buildings use, most apartment buildings, most uh, businesses. And it allows you to hook this thing up. And during the day when you need power, we can feed power back to the grid. At night when power is cheaper, we can suck power out of the grid to recharge the battery. It can also be charged with uh, renewable energy. If you have a solar power system, you can program it to accept energy while you're generating. We have one of these set up down at one of the UCSD buildings, uh, one of the libraries. And it both performs that function, so it performs the function of absorbing solar energy during the day, um, feeding it back when it's needed. And it also allows you to back up the air conditioning systems in the library. The, the library down there contains manuscripts from, uh, from Jonas Salk, which are really valuable. They want to keep them under temperature control at all times. And I think they even have the original writings of 
uh, Theodore Geisel, who's Dr. Seuss. So they want to, you know, kind of protect that part of the library and make sure that even if the power goes out, it doesn't get really hot in there. Interesting. So that's an actual current application where the Smartville 360 is being used. Is that correct? Yeah. And if you if you go to the website, most of the pictures that you'll see are of that installation. That was our first installation. So apparently a key part of this solution is uh, a couple important parts. One is a tool that can work in salvage operations to test a battery and determine if it's able to be, you know, what it can be used for. Is that correct? Yeah. Since we've needed EV batteries, we've been going out looking for them. And we have a we have an unusual problem, which is that EV batteries have been lasting way longer than anybody expected. Like most Teslas go, go their entire life on a single battery. So we haven't seen this flood of batteries in the market yet, although we know it's coming because eventually the cars are going to wear out. Um, and that means that we have to go to wrecking yards, junkyards, places where cars that have been in accidents uh, end up. And in those yards, we will talk to the people who run the yards and they're very good at parting out cars and, you know, if you need a front end, this you go over here and if you need a transmission, you go over here. Nobody has many, nobody has very much experience with batteries yet though. So when we talk to these people at the junkyard, we ask them what condition the batteries are in and they'll say, oh, that one looks pretty good and that one's not too dirty. And that's, that's about the level of kind of judgment they give on us on the batteries, like what it looks like and, and whether or not it's been actually part of the accident, like if it's dented. That's not a lot of information. So we built a tool that just plugs into the battery. So inside every battery, inside every EV battery, there's something called a BMS, a battery management system. And it kind of watches what's happening with the battery. It looks at temperatures, it looks at voltages, it looks at currents, it looks at its, what's happening over the lifetime of the battery. And it keeps track of what's going on so that you can make sure the battery is safe to use and make sure the batteries can be charged quickly. We can connect to that and download the information from it and look at it and see whether the battery is still in balance, whether the battery has been abused, um, whether the battery can still hold the charge. So we can get a lot of that information up front before we ever take the battery even out of the car. So that's what the Periscope is. And that's called the, the battery management system. Did I say that correctly? Yes. The thing in the battery is the battery management system. And the system that Smartville developed is the Periscope, you said? Yes. Interested in talking a little bit about some of the problems with electric vehicle batteries, some of the problems that Smartville's trying to solve by repurposing these batteries. Could you talk about that a little bit? Some of the issues or, or you know problems that arise by using these batteries in cars? So EV batteries are designed to store as much energy as possible in as small a space as possible to allow long ranges, high speeds for EVs. That means you need to use lithium ion batteries, which are currently the most energy dense batteries out there. And lithium ion batteries aren't, aren't great in some ways. They take a lot of raw materials. They take, typical lithium ion battery will take 10 to 20 pounds of lithium, take a few ounces of cobalt, and it's, it's fairly energy intensive to produce. So one solution obviously there is to recycle them at the end of their life, which is, which is being done now, but you still lose all that energy that goes into making them. So one of the one of the reasons we're considering the second life effort is important is because then you get more benefit of that out of that energy that you put into making the battery. So it, the battery itself has a longer life. You get more use out of the same energy that you use to build the battery. And when you're done with it at the end of its life, you can still go and take out all of the all of the raw materials and recycle them. One of the one of the problems that we faced early on is that. Early EV batteries used a lot of cobalt. They used a lot of lithium just to get the performance. And nowadays, the amount of cobalt specifically needed for lithium ion batteries is dropping dramatically. So there's very little cobalt in a modern EV battery. But when you look at the old EV batteries that are coming out of cars, they're full of the stuff. So there was a little bit of a competition between the Second Life companies and the recyclers because the recyclers really wanted access to these early batteries because they had a lot of valuable minerals in them. And that's that's getting better now. It's a legitimate concern because, you know, we talk about lithium, cobalt, uh, nickel, some of the other elements that go into these batteries. You know, they're, they it is very energy intensive to mine 
these these minerals, these metals. Um, reading how lithium extraction can take eighteen months, uh, uses enormous amounts of water. So that's a concern, but then also just the process of manufacturing these batteries. It's really interesting, to, though, to hear you talk about like the old EV batteries because objectively, I'm thinking, yes, I understand that EVs, you know, electric vehicles have been around for a while now, uh, but it just seems like they haven't. And it seems interesting that there's been, you know, s- significant advancements in the battery technology already just in the amount of time that, that they've been out. Yeah. Um, the Leaf came out in. 2010, and that was the really the first mass market EV that you could buy, and it was kind of a terrible EV if you look at it objectively. It had a range of about 70 miles. The batteries degraded quickly. They weren't very good in the heat. They didn't have a, a thermal management system, so if it was hot out, batteries got hot. And those are the batteries that kind of are, are really sought after right now, both by people doing second life batteries and by uh, battery recyclers because they have so much minerals in them. The the format, it was also really nice. They packaged two of these lithium ion batteries into something that's about the size of a big notebook. So they were very easy to take out and to rebuild into a different shape, into a different form factor. So a lot of people were wanting these batteries. They could build their own batteries for their house, batteries for their custom EV or whatever. So there was a lot of demand for them. Smartville estimates that approximately 70% of battery packs in, in salvage yards are actually good enough to be put back into use as spares and replacement packs for EVs. Around 10% of EV packs are damaged or otherwise not viable, so they would need to be recycled. And then there are about 20% that could potentially be used by Smartville for your energy storage systems. Does that sound correct? Yeah, the percentages that we've been able to use are, are higher than that, but th- those are the kind of trade-offs we made. There's always some batteries that have been underwater, been in wrecks, and they're dented that you just can't use because they're unsafe. But the large, a large percentage of the remaining batteries are very usable. And you determine how usable they are by deciding how much energy you want out of them. There's a small percentage, like two or 3% of those batteries, where somebody gets a Tesla, they drive it off the lot, they drive it for a thousand miles, and they smash it into something. And then we get a battery that's 95% good. The batteries that, that are at the end of the life of the car are closer to 60%. So we kind of decide where we want to draw that line. And the higher we draw it, the fewer batteries we get. It's interesting that you said a moment ago that electric batteries are lasting longer than people thought they would, that in some cases they're lasting the life of the car. Because I've heard that as one of the criticisms of electric vehicles um, and I think I know, I know somebody personally who bought. Now, admittedly, they bought a used Prius. I'm not sure what you know the, how the previous owner took care of it, but I do know that they end up having to replace the battery. Um, but it sounds like what you're saying is that's not maybe as common as people might think to have to replace the battery within the life of the car. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, and um, I think the only kind of really concerted effort to track Tesla batteries' lifetime. Tesla battery lifetimes that's public was by a group in Scandinavia somewhere, I forget where, but they're seeing Tesla batteries last 200,000, even 300,000 miles, you know, with some degradation, but apparently with little enough degradation that people find them very useful. So that's, that's hit us a little bit because the batteries that are available are, since they are a demand for, you know, people who are doing things like this, like what we're doing, there's a limited supply and a high demand. So we're actually paying a significant amount of money for the batteries we can get. And in terms of uh, Smartville's solution, another thing I was reading about that I found interesting is with these these battery packs that you're creating, these, these storage units that you're creating, from what I understand, they're actually tricking the battery into thinking that it's running in inside a car. Uh, so one article described it as like you're sticking the batteries in the matrix and making them think that they're in cars. Could you talk about that a little more? Sure. Um, that's, a, that's a good description. So EV batteries are designed very specifically to output huge amounts of power in a short amount of time. The batteries for the Tesla Plaid, for example, will give you uh, 750 kilowatts, which is over a thousand horsepower for the amount of time it takes to accelerate, which is 10 seconds or so. And that's a that's way more power than you would ever expect out of a stationary battery. So they're designed differently. 
the manufacturers also have to be very careful because the either the 400 or the 800 volts DC that the car uses is super dangerous. Um, DC is much more dangerous than AC because when you touch AC accidentally, it tends to make you spasm and flail around, and that tends to make you let go of whatever you're touching. DC makes you lock up. So if you touch something with DC, suddenly you can't move and you stay in contact with the electricity. So vehicle manufacturers have gone to extraordinary lengths to make sure that you can't touch any energized part of the car while it's running. For example, Tesla batteries, before they'll even engage their outputs, they want to see a very specific um, capacitance and resistance in the car before it'll connect. Because if it sees that specific capacitance and resistance, it has a reasonable assurance that it's connected to the car's inverter and motor, and it's safe to turn on. Another thing that it does is it's constantly looking at current flow. There's two wires coming out of the battery, and the current comes out of one and goes back in the other. And as long as those two currents add up exactly to zero, so there's just as much going out as coming back in, then nobody's getting shocked and current's not going anyplace unexpected. If that ever changes, then the battery shuts down immediately because something, something's wrong with the system. So to make the battery think that it's still in the vehicle is you have to put it, like you said, in the matrix and, and give it that capacitance and resistance it's expecting to see. So a lot of kind of our secret sauce are ways to get the battery to think it's connected to a car. And while it's being used, make sure the battery keeps thinking that it's in a car. It's a really interesting solution. Um, this is not at all what I expected to be reading about as part of the solution. This is like a, a Star Wars thing where you have to like, like, you know, talk to the computer and convince the computer to help you. It makes sense, though, from a safety standpoint, though, that these batteries would have a lot of these safety systems in place so that the, the battery needs to be confident that it's actually attached to a properly operating car to work. I'm in, I'm in North Carolina right now and was reading about something fairly close to us in South Carolina. Uh, and I'm just going to read this, some excerpts from this article I was reading. Three of South Carolina's historically black colleges and universities will be involved in a nationwide project that has been awarded $10 million from the U.S. Department of Energy, $10 million. The Second Life Smart Systems Project is going to provide grid resiliency and backup power while simultaneously helping lower energy costs for senior centers, low-income, multifamily affordable housing complexes, and EV charging facilities in San Diego, Atlanta, New Orleans, Orangeburg, and Denmark, South Carolina. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. That's, that's kind of the applications we're aiming for. When people are looking for battery systems, they want them for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, one is something called grid services. And grid services are, they provide the same thing that generators used to provide for the grid. Generators are great because a generator is a big spinning iron thing that spins at a certain speed and sends power out to the grid at a certain frequency. So if you throw a sudden load on there, it actually starts to physically slow down that iron rotor. And that provides you some inertia so you can kind of ride through these spikes. As more and more places switch from big spinning generators to inverters, which are more efficient, that's not there anymore. So utilities uh, go out and they ask people to supply them grid services. And grid services are things like inverters that just maintain the frequency or inverters that just maintain the voltage. They'll also provide some backup in case this, it's in case the grid sags, like in case a whole bunch of people start charging their EVs at once. These battery systems provide a surge to go pump back into the grid so you don't see the voltage drop. At the next level, uh, utilities want battery systems to do things like peak shaving. So if there's this huge peak um, because it's 5 p.m. on a Friday and it's 100 degrees out in Phoenix, these battery systems can pump a few gigawatts into the grid and prevent brownouts and prevent blackouts. Going a step beyond that, there are needs for things like backup power for hospitals, backup power for neighborhoods and police stations um, that is normally provided with generators. Generators are big and expensive. And if you can replace that with something like a eight or 16 hours worth of storage, often it makes economic sense for those people. So, those are kind of the the places that these energy systems end up end up fitting into. 
I remember hearing about one of the problems or issues that power companies are facing is with uh, more people like I don't know if this is a you know current existing issue or potential issue but as more and more people are using solar there's the potential problem that during the day when the sun's out people won't need as much power from you know the central power stations but then at night when the sun goes down then more power is needed and I, apparently it's from what I understand, kind of difficult to just spool up and spool down a power station like that, a tr- you know conventional power station. I've heard about things like these, you know, uh, battery packs, storage solutions being used to address that problem, right? So now it's nighttime, but now you have your your large batteries providing the power. But it's interesting some of the things you're talking about, which are just normal problems that occur in power generation and distribution, like the brownouts you were talking about, or like in emergencies where generators have traditionally been used. So now you're saying that these battery storage packs could potentially be used not just to provide power at night, but to address some of these other existing issues with with the power grid and, and problems that need to be addressed. Exactly. Um, the problem you're describing is often referred to as ramp rate. And ramp rate is the speed at which you have to increase generation at night. And the, the, the big draw happens right around 3 or 4 p.m. Because what happens during hot days is people leave work, they start getting home, they turn on their air conditioners, they turn on their lights. At the same time, the office is still running, so the air conditioner at their office is still sucking power. Also, what's happening now is that solar generation is starting to fall off. So they that's a really steep ramp that utilities have to be able to maintain enough generation to keep the lights on. And in California, they're, they're turning more and more to battery systems for that. Um, we just made a visit up to a, a power station um, very near Disney in Southern California. And what they're doing is they have this very classic fossil fuel peaker plant. It runs on natural gas. It's got, I forget how many megawatts it is, but it's got two turbines that take about 10 minutes to come up to speed and to you know, get all their emissions controls up and running and get their, um, get the temperature stabilized, they can start generating power. And what they used to have to do is they used to have, whenever it was hot out and they were expecting a high demand, they fire the turbine up, they prepare to dump power onto the grid. And then if the grid needed it, then they would put power on the grid and make money. And if they didn't need it, since they, since their power was kind of the most expensive power out there, because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's basically converting natural gas into energy. Um, they wouldn't sell any and they'd have to shut down, but they would incur all that wear on the turbine and they'd have to use fuel to do it. So they recently upgraded with a battery system so that now if they get that demand, they keep the turbine off and they just provide power with the inverter if they need it because that inverter can be up, up and running in seconds. If the demand goes on for more than 10 minutes, only then do they fire up the turbine. And if the ben- demand goes on for more than 20 minutes, then they start using the, t- the turbine to both send power to the grid and to recharge the battery. So they've cut their expenses by something like 60%. Um, they've cut their emissions by even more than that because often now they just never have to fire up the turbine. It's just all batteries. And what's what helps them is that the power draw, if you look at it on a daily perspective, there are times like at midnight where power draw is really low. And here in California, it's about a two to one ratio. So during a really hot day, we might be drawing 50 gigawatts. At night, it draws it drops to 20, 25 gigawatts. And that difference represents all of this extra capacity that's not being used. And that capacity is then used to recharge the batteries to get ready for the next hot day. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I wasn't aware to the extent that battery systems are already being used for these purposes. When you talk about inverters, is it correct that that's, that's basically a system that takes battery power and turns it into like the, the alternating current, the power that we have coming into our homes? Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Um, almost all power in the U.S. is still AC power for a lot of historical reasons. And so what inverters do is they take that DC power, which is just plus and minus, and they invert it back and forth. They flip it back and forth to turn it into AC. And it's obviously, there's a lot more going, going on than that, but that's that's what it's basically doing. 
What are some of the big challenges that Smartville is currently facing or obstacles that have to still be overcome to make this technology wild, widely available and successful? So there's a few. The big one in my mind is safety. Um, we, we're getting these used batteries in. And like I mentioned, right now, we'll go to a junkyard at the the level of evaluation by the junkyard. will be like, oh, that one looks good. Take that one. So we don't have a good sense of what we're getting in sometimes. So the Periscope will help with that. It'll help us to evaluate them. Um, what we'd really like to do, though, is really we'd really like to get to a point where we're working with a company like Tesla, Nissan, Fiat, companies like that, where they will give us kind of a battery history. So if we know that a battery was built in this factory with these cells, lived a long life in this car for eight years, we're now getting it, we know how many cycles it has, that's huge because then we can track back to which cells that we used to make the battery. We can track back to whether the battery was abused, whether it's been in a second car, and that makes the battery a lot safer to store and a lot safer to use. So that's one thing we're working on. And we think we have to get enough kind of recognition and respect in the market before companies like that will talk to us. You know, once we start making these systems and they work and people seem to like them, I think we'll get more interest from car companies in working with us. Another issue that we're working with right now is certification. So if you want to buy a battery system and install it and have it be approved, generally it's got to be UL certified. UL has a standard called the 9540 standard, which all batteries commercially sold meet. And it's a safety spec, it's an operational spec, and it's a getting that as a, it's a year or so effort, and it takes a lot of work to get it. So that's one of the things we're working on. There's also a spec called UL 1974, and that's a spec that was written years ago, and it's a way to take a Second Life EV battery and turn it into a battery that you, you can put in a 9540 system. To do that, though, you need to run through this process, and the process was written for a completely different battery. So to make that work, we'll probably have to actually go to UL with some suggested changes to that spec, get them approved, and then certify to that spec, and that's going to be a long process. So those are probably the two big ones. One is the information that just lets us make sure that the battery is safe to use and will, will work for a long time. And the second are the certifications we have to get. You mentioned the back in 1993 driving the, an electric vehicle for the first time. And I'm wondering if there are any other like moments that you remember, like a story about one day in your life or one thing that happened that really inspired you to get involved in this work that you're doing now. It's a good question. There are a few days that I can think of. Um, one was two years ago. I was with a group at Burning Man, and I had volunteered to set up the power system. So we built this three kilowatt solar array. We had about ten kilowatt hours worth of batteries. Uh, we had an inverter to turn that all that DC power into AC for the camp to use. And I had set it all up, and it was working. And people kept adding things to it. They Somebody tried to use a hairdryer, it worked. Somebody added an air conditioner, it worked. Somebody else added a refrigerator box, that worked. And as all of this was going on, I had a friend of mine set up his tent underneath the solar array. And it was a, it was a kind of solar panel called a bifacial, which is partly transparent. So some sun came through, most of the sun was blocked. And his biggest memory of Burning Man that year was camping under the solar panel because it was shady and he still got a little bit of light and it was running the camp and he was very excited by that. And just seeing his excitement that this was, you know, not only doable, but it was something that he helped set up and now it was working. It was really cool to see that level of excitement in him. I think the second time was the first time I put a solar system on my own house and that was back in 2002 or 2003. And being able to put it up and for the first time seeing like seeing the meter spin backwards, because back then we actually had mechanical meters. And once you had the array installed, the meter would stop spinning. And then as you generated more and more power, it would spin backwards, indicating you were feeding power back to the grid. That was pretty cool. What do you like most about your job that you're doing right now? I like a lot of parts of it. I like going into a 
battery system that nobody understands and kind of working to understand it, kind of building that, as you described, like a matrix around it so that it thinks it's in an EV and it's perfectly happy to provide power to the inverter as if it were in an EV and getting all of that to work. Working at a startup with a lot of 20-year-olds who are really excited about their technology, you know, trying to set up all the systems that that support them, you know, the, the management system that lets, you know, you evaluate and pay people, the HR systems that deal with paying for all, all the things in the company. Just the details of setting up the company have been fun for me. So if someone's interested in doing the kind of work you're doing, like maybe someone wants to pursue a degree in engineering with the goal of doing work that's focused on the environment or on sustainability, what advice do you have for them? The biggest piece of advice I would have would be just start doing it. There is so much information out there on how to do DIY solar, do-it-yourself setups. Um, You can buy anything from a Blue Eddy system, which is they sell you boxes with cables, you plug everything in and you're done and it works, all the way to systems where you buy the panel surplus, you get old golf cart batteries, you hook everything up yourself. Doing that teaches you a tremendous amount about renewable energy. Um, I've interviewed a lot of people from engineering schools who did well in engineering school and they come in with just no practical experience. And for the first six months or so they're on the job, they're, they're almost dangerous because they don't know what they don't know at that point. And getting them through that, thir- that first six months is, is a challenge. And then they get experience and they become effective. They become useful. Um, you know, which is which is the goal of hiring people and mentoring them. But getting people in who have that ex- practical experience, who have built systems that they put on their house or that they used camping or that they took to Burning Man is huge because that means you don't have to spend that six months with them getting them through the phase of, I understand what the math means. I don't understand what any of it does. So practical experience is huge. That's interesting. I, I could picture that being great advice for like parents out there. If you have a child who is interested in being an engineer, they're really serious about it. And you have the capability to do some kind of hands-on project and show them what that looks like and get them interested. I'm thinking this is like the 2024 version of showing your kid how to build a birdhouse. Um, that's really interesting that that would be something that would be really beneficial or, or a good piece of advice. Yeah. And I think the most important kind of message to get across to kids is the world of technology and the world of engineering is not a magic world that you can't enter without the right degrees and certifications and everything. And then you enter it and you're done. It's something that anybody can get, you know, a five-year-old kid can build things with batteries and LEDs. You know, somebody who's 10 can build a science project that includes an Arduino controller. And there's there's a perceived barrier, but there really is no barrier. And um, there's so much technology and so much help out there now for kids who want to do that. It's, it's, it's a great time to be a kid, I think, because you can get into all of this stuff quickly. The information is available online. And there are you know, these programs set up to act- actively help you get, in- get involved with that. So I very much encourage that. And any parents out there who are trying to get their kids into it, just get on the web, look for Arduino coding, um, you know, electronics for kids. It's very much worth it. Yeah, it sounds like there might even be some um, projects that, like you mentioned coding. So maybe there are some things kids can do hands-on that are not that prohibitively expensive where you're not having to buy a lot of equipment. Um, You even mentioned doing some things with like surplus solar cells and old golf cart batteries. So it sounds like there are a lot of different opportunities out there. What right now, looking ahead to the next, I don't know, five or 10 years from where you are, like big picture, what's something that you're really excited about that may be coming up in the future? Um, Something that I'm both excited about and think absolutely has to happen is we have to get away from our current vision of what the power grid is. Like since the, since power grids have started, the what people think of as a power grid is there's some central power plants. They're huge. Sometimes they're polluting, which is an issue. Um, Those that power is distributed through substations over transmission lines and eventually gets into smaller and smaller transmission lines until it ends up in your house where it makes toast. 
And that concept of this big, just big centralized kind of trickle down system where you get a little bit of the power that's produced is it's kind of no longer viable anymore. Utilities are having a lot of trouble now because everybody's putting solar on their houses and they're, they kind of, they don't know how to manage that and they don't know how to make money off of that. So I think the future of the grid is a much more decentralized grid with where you have uh, distributed these distributed energy resources, whether they're solar or storage, and the grid is smart enough to utilize them to not need as big transmission lines as we once needed, like to not need as big substations as we once needed. If you can put storage near the loads, for example, suddenly the amount of power you have to send over the transmission lines isn't the amount of power that's represented by every single person turning on their air conditioner when they're getting home. It's the average power that that area needs. And if everybody does get home at the same time and turn on their air conditioner, local storage of the kind that we build and the kind that you can get commercially now uh, provides that extra energy. So seeing that that change is going to be it's going to be painful in some ways because you know there are big utilities out there who have been doing this for a long time and that's how they make money and that's how they that's how they see the world. But it's also going to be exciting to see how that evolves and what we end up with. I'm curious. I'm wondering if maybe you you've seen any of this or are aware of any of this and just how much if we look at utility companies, people running utility companies, the people who are very invested in the system as it is, does there seem to be any willingness to pivot or any desire or real genuine interest in doing things in new ways? Or are they just going to kind of fight a tooth and nail for as long as they can? I, I think there's a huge spread of those desires within the company. When I was at Qualcomm doing this thing called E0, we were talking to uh, sdg e which is our local utility, and we were proposing several things that they could try. And at one point, one of their VPs said to us, there's a lot of these things we'd like to try, but until somebody passes a law that says we have to do it, we legally can't because we have all these, we're following all these rules that, you know, we can't raise costs on ratepayers unless we get approval from the Public Utilities Commission, and they're not going to do it until a law says that they have to do it. Um, at the same time, I think there's a lot of people in those industries who know that this is coming and are working on it right now using R&D funding or funding they get other places um, to prepare for it because they know it's coming. So I think there's a, there's a huge variety of, of takes on that. And I think one of the reasons it's going to be painful is there's a lot of structural resistance to it. And that has to be overcome. So I have one more question that I'd like to ask you. It's a question I ask everyone at the end of these episodes. And you, you may, maybe it's, you already answered this earlier, or this could be something totally different. This could be personal, professional, answer this any way you want. But what is your dream right now? Yeah, oh, good question. My own personal dream is to be part of the, an effort, and in this case, the effort is solar and storage, to put the earth in a direction so that it ends up in a place that I want my kids to live in. And I have two kids, 12 and nine right now, they're going to have kids. And I'd like to leave them with a world which, you know, it's not fixed. There's a lot of problems with the world, but just it's kind of going in the right direction. So that's a lot of what I'm doing now here, and like I, I teach a robotics course at, at, the, at, the, at their school, um, is to try to just be an influence nudging things in the right direction. You know, I can only make a small impact, but if everybody makes it, I figure that's a good, good thing to do. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Bill, this has been really interesting as someone who's always been interested in science and technology and uh, also interested in sustainability. Yeah, this is just really interesting to learn more about this. So thank you very much for sharing all this with us. Sure. You can learn more about Smartville on their website, smartville.io. We'll include that link in the show notes, along with links to a couple of articles about the work that Smartville is doing. One of these articles from news station WLTX is about historically black colleges and universities in South Carolina, which are part of a $10 million U.S. Department of Energy Renewable Energy Project. That's the article that I quoted from earlier in this episode. 
If you're interested in reading that whole article, you can find the link in the show notes. As always, there is something quick and simple you can do right now to help spread the word about people like Bill and companies like Smartville that are working to create a cooler world. If you're listening on YouTube, give this episode a like and subscribe to our channel and maybe leave a comment saying what you liked about this episode. I always enjoy reading those comments. If you're listening on Spotify, you can follow us and rate the podcast. On Apple Podcasts, you can follow us or scroll down to the bottom of the list of episodes and rate the podcast and maybe leave a review. And of course, you can share the podcast on your favorite social media. Our website is creatingacoolerworld.com. You can always share that link and send people there. All these things really help. They help other people find our podcast. They help us get the word out. If you know someone who might be a good guest, let us know. Go to our website, creatingacoolerworld.com. There's a form right on the homepage that you can use to send us a message. Bill and I actually met a long time ago, but I hadn't talked to him in years, and I didn't know about all of this interesting work that he's involved in until our mutual friend Kate said, hey, you should get in touch with Bill Von Novak and have him on your show. And by the way, Kate, thank you very much. That was a fantastic idea. If you know someone who might enjoy being on the show, let us know. Here's the dog update. The dogs like to bark at, well, lots of things, actually. You might have heard them in the background on a couple of these episodes. And I've taught Bug to stop barking when I say zip it. She at least stops barking for a few moments when I say zip it. Lately, I've been teaching the dogs to bark more quietly when I say quiet. And that's actually working. And it's pretty funny. Uh Quiet. Uh That's it, folks. Thanks for listening. Take care.